Hi, I'm Greg Stanton. I'm the president of Genocide Watch uh, and also the James Farmer Professor in Human Rights at the University of Mary Washington. And today I want to talk to you about the eight stages of genocide. I've studied genocide uh, since about 1980 when I served in Cambodia. And when I went to work in the State Department, I worked very much on the aftermath of the Rwandan genocide. And one of the things that I discovered in looking at those genocides, as well as many others, is that there was a pattern, that there was a predictable sequence of events. And using that sequence, in fact, it could be very helpful to policymakers to prevent genocide by seeing genocide coming and knowing what steps could be taken at each of the stages to do something to stop it. The first stage is classification. Now, of course, all human beings classify. There's always us and there's them. There's our group and there's the others. And this is not necessarily, of course, a genocidal step. But it's absolutely necessary for genocide. Because if we don't have a way to say some people are other and there are the others, there are, are not part of us, then there is no way you can have genocide. So in fact, the way to uh, counteract genocide at that very early, early stage is to appeal to transcendent identities. That is, we're all Rwandans, or we're all, you know, human actually is the most transcendent of all of the identities. Uh, the second stage is symbolization, where we have words or symbols that express those classifications. We call people Jews or Germans, um, we are Tutsis or, or uh, Hutus. Um, sometimes we even put physical symbols on people. Of course, the most, uh, um, the most uh, well known of those was the Nazi Yellow Star. The best way to counteract uh, symbolization is when you see physical symbols that are being applied to pariah groups. Things like, for example, uh, uh, yellow pieces of cloth that were the Taliban tried to put on Hindus in Afghanistan. You raise a hue and cry because that kind of symbolization is um, a precursor for genocidal activity. When you see people's religion or there are other types of uh, distinguishing identity that can be used for persecution on their identity cards, you oppose that. You try to get that taken off the identity cards. In Rwanda, I, in fact, told the president directly in uh, 1988 that they needed to take those ethnic identities off of the identity cards in Rwanda. But, of course, unfortunately, I wasn't speaking to the right man um, because, actually, the president favored genocide at that time in Rwanda. Um, the third stage, and this is the stage where really the genocidal downward spiral begins, because all people classify and symbolize, but the third stage is dehumanization. It's where we begin to treat one group as somehow less than human. Where, and the, the, the way that that is often expressed is using uh, animal language, for instance, calling people vermin or cockroaches, as they uh, called the Tutsis in Rwanda. Um, equating uh, the group that is targeted as being a cancer or microbes in the system. When you hear that kind of language, you know you have a very serious dehumanization problem in that society. Um, and that has to be fought very vigorously. When you hear dehumanizing words being used, um, words like kafir, for instance, in South Africa, uh, or words, uh, you know, like nigger was used in the South here. You have to fight against those. You have to say that is culturally you know, unacceptable. Um, the fourth stage of genocide, because genocide is always a group crime, is organization. If a group is formed, a hate group, that is organizing to carry out hate crimes, that group must be outlawed. And the people who become part of that group need to be arrested because they are, in fact, engaging in essentially organized crime. Uh, 
That was the way the SS was treated at Nuremberg. It was the way the inter highway should have been treated in Rwanda. Um, free association doesn't mean the right to organize to commit genocide. Um, the, for, the fifth stage of genocide uh, is polarization, in which the hate groups try to drive the society apart, in which they try to drive out all the moderates who could stop the process. So the first groups that are always attacked in every genocide are people from the group of the, of the, who is committing the genocide, but who are moderates who might oppose it. So for instance, in Germany, the first people to be arrested by Hitler uh, were the Social Democrats, uh, the uh, liberals, the uh, liberal Christians, for instance, who might oppose uh, the Nazi regime. Uh, and they're also the first people to be killed. So for instance, in Rwanda, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, who was Hutu, uh, the head of the Supreme Court, who was Hutu, they were among the first people to be killed on the first day of the genocide. Um, that kind of polarization, when you see it, you have to uh, get international pressure uh, to be put on a regime that is attempting to do that. Unfortunately, we are seeing exactly that strategy being used in Iraq right now, uh, on many sides in Iraq. Polarization is uh, going on, and you can see in many cases what people call ethnic cleansing is actually very much pre-genocidal type activity. Um, the sixth stage is what I call preparation. It is the stage at which people uh, are armed, at which the uh, militias form and are trained to carry out the genocide. Uh, it's the stage at which even sometimes concentration camps are being built. Uh, you have uh, a, an attempt to uh, transport and segregate the targeted population into ghettos, for instance, in some cases. Uh, you mark the houses of people who are targeted. When you see this kind of preparation, and then, of course, you have even trial massacres, when that happens, the international community has to cry out. Uh, not only that, the leaders of that sort of uh, trial, massacre, and uh, uh, preparation need to have sanctions placed upon them as individuals. It must become impossible for them to travel. They have to have their finances frozen. They basically have to become uh, international outlaws. The seventh stage is what we would call genocide legally because I, it's extermination. And I use that term because the people who commit genocide are very frequently people who believe that what they're doing is good for their society. They actually think they're purifying their society. The Nazis, for instance, thought that uh, by uh, eliminating the Jews from Europe, it was going to actually make a better Europe. Uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, for instance, thought that by eliminating their class enemies, they would uh, be able to create a, uh, a perfect society a classless society. Uh, in Rwanda, the thought was, if we can just get rid of all these Tutsis, then we'll have a perfect Hutu-run country. Uh, so it's extermination. It's very similar uh, to uh, the, the words that are used um, in um, uh, describing the victims, you know, cockroaches, and so forth. I'm convinced that at the point where genocide is actually going on, so much international pressure has to be placed on the government to stop it or on the, the groups that are committing it that probably in most cases armed intervention is necessary. Um, and um, unfortunately, the international community does not yet have um, the, uh, the uh, standing uh, police forces and uh, international army to do that kind of intervention. So probably the most common type of intervention at this point is going to still be by regional organizations, by NATO, uh, by uh, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. Other groups of that sort can, in fact, intervene to, to actually bring a halt to that kind of genocide. That was what happened, for instance, in Sierra Leone, finally, and in uh, Liberia. It's finally, of course, uh, it took the Allies to defeat Hitler in the Second World War uh, and bring an end to the Holocaust. Um, but the 
there is a strange and uh, uh, unusual uh, eighth stage of every genocide. When I first realized that there was this eighth stage, I thought, well, this is, I, I don't know whether this is quite the same thing, because it actually begins right at the, all the way from the beginning. There's a, but this eighth stage is denial. All the way through this whole process, the people who are committing the genocide deny that they're doing it. They will lie, they will uh, dissimulate, they will do what the Sudanese ambassador just did yesterday here in Washington, actually say it isn't happening in Darfur. I mean, completely deny the facts. Or they'll find all sorts of other excuses for denial. Um, and what's amazing about denial is that unless there are actual trials, courts that can uh, bring to justice the people who've committed the genocide, who can have the facts brought out so that there's no doubt about what happened, the denial can last for a hundred years. That is what is still going on, for example, with the Armenian genocide, and the Turkish authorities are still denying that it was a genocide. So those are the eight stages, and what I'm convinced of is that at each of the stages, there are steps that can be taken to halt this deadly process. In Darfur, each of these stages uh, is evident. Um, the classification of the population uh, by the uh, Sudanese authorities is essentially into Arabs and uh, Arabic-speaking uh, Darfurians, uh, who uh, they consider lighter skinned, they consider them a superior race. There's even a group within the uh, uh, Sudanese government called the Arab Gathering that actually has an ideology that's very much like Nazism. Um, and the Africans, the people who are blacker, who belong to the Fur, the Masalit, uh, the Zagawa, uh, the, the people who uh, are, uh, the, for the most part, the farmers in in um, Darfur. So the classification is not only one that is imposed by the perpetrators in this case, but also was there uh, anyway uh, in the society. The only thing was it, it wasn't a murderous kind of classification in the past. It was, it's only been recently that that's become uh, an excuse for murder. The symbolization, of course, is the kind of symbolization you get uh, when Arabs say, well, you, I uh, am raping you so that you will have a lighter skinned child. It is this symbolization of race. Uh, the lighter skinned, the, the black, uh, and along with that you have dehumanizing words uh, in which, for instance, uh, people who are uh, of African uh, origin uh, are called slaves in the uh, by, by the uh, Arab leaders. Uh, they are considered to be properly in the status of slavery in the society. Um, that type of dehumanization is, uh, is part of this genocide. The, the uh, organization, of course, has been one in which the Sudanese government has given arms and, um, and the spoils of, uh, of pillage to the Janjaweed militias, uh, instead of using the Sudanese army directly in most of these raids, although they are involved, the Sudanese army is involved, they do use tanks and they do use army trucks and so forth, the Janjaweed uh, are, uh, you know, uh, essentially local uh, militias who ride on horseback and camels in and carry out many of the murders. So that's the form of organization in this genocide. Um, the polarization um, is very clear. What the Janjaweed are attempting to do is drive all of the Africans, the black Africans, into uh, internally displaced persons camps um, where they can be separated. And they are also systematically uh, killing off any uh, moderate Arabs who stand in their way. Uh, they're not allowing local tribal chiefs, for instance, to have uh, to have to govern as they're properly supposed to do. Uh, the preparation stage uh, was one in which, of course, the Sudanese government had already committed 
multiple genocides in other places, it was a well-practiced genocidal regime, having already committed genocide in the Nuba Mountains in 1992, in the South for over 20 years, uh, in which over 2 million people died. Uh, the preparation in Darfur had been one in which they had um, had uh, had systematic uh, persecution and discrimination against black Africans, but then when black Africans in Darfur demanded uh, their rights and, a, and rebel movements formed, uh, at that point the whole situation moved into stage seven, actual genocide. And that is when the Antonov bombers from the Sudanese um, Air Force started bombing villages and helicopter gunships uh, came in and strafed the villages and then the Janjaweed militias would follow up and actually murder all the men that they found and try to rape all the women and drive them all out of their villages and then burn the villages. This is genocide. Uh, people can argue all they want about whether the term genocide ought to be applied in this case. Uh, frankly, we in Genocide Watch don't really care about whether it's genocide or politicide or crimes against humanity, the point is people are being murdered. And in my own view, there's so much evidence of specific intent here that you need to prove genocide because you can see systematic action by the Janjaweed supported by the government that we don't need to have specific orders, you know, that we that are written down somewhere that say, you know, go out there and kill all those blacks, although apparently uh, such orders have been given and that we have witnesses who are willing to testify to that. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one of the major human rights organizations even came up with papers that they had gotten in uh, Khartoum that showed direct connection uh, from the government to the um, Janjaweed and to this genocide. Uh, denial, it has been going on from the beginning. The Sudanese government has been denying all the way from the beginning that they're not doing this. They've been saying they, they, you know, oh, it's really just a tribal conflict. That's one of the most common uh, forms of denial. Oh, it's just a conflict between uh, pastoralists uh, and uh, uh, the uh, farmers. Uh, you know, it's it's ancient enmities. Well, that's absolutely false. That is, these people have lived together for hundreds of years and they have not committed genocide against each other. That has not happened until 2003. Uh, the, uh, another thing they do, of course, in denial is to uh, try to minimize the statistics. They say, oh no, it's only a few thousand people that have died, when in fact it's more like 400,000 people who have died. Uh, and they'll just sometimes blatantly deny that anything is going wrong at all, such as the Sudanese ambassador did yesterday here at the National Press Club here in Washington. Um, there's a, a marvelous article in the Washington Post that just uh, this morning that um, shows how ridiculous, in fact, his arguments were. Um, and you also have, uh, you know, arguments like, uh, well, these people are, uh, are, are different. Uh, we shouldn't really worry about them. They're too far away from us. Uh, it's the uh, it's a form of uh, kind of racist um, um, dismissal of their rights and of, of their uh, fundamental right to live. Um, you also have denial in the form of um, a, what could be called the um, how can you point your finger at us when you are doing bad things in Iraq argument. You know, it's the uh, pure hands, the clean hands doctrine that uh, is often uh, used in, in international law. And of course, it's no defense against uh, the crime of genocide. Um, whatever bad things uh, our government has done at one time or another is no defense for the Sudanese government to be committing genocide against its own people. Um, all of these types of denial are very evident in this case in, in Darfur. Now the question of course is, what can we do now? Um, I'm convinced that um, there have to be, first of all, a really major uh, increase in peacemaking. Uh, it has to be placed much higher in the priority uh, of the United States government and other 
uh, major powers in the, in the world. Uh, we've got to get China involved in this. We've got to get France involved. Uh, I think that that really uh, having a common objective and pushing the Sudanese towards ending this the way we finally were able to do about what ha was happening in the South um, uh, is very essential. Secondly, I think there has to be protection of the people. Uh, we have to keep up this humanitarian relief effort as, as much as we can. This has been a, a very important part in, of the uh, process in Darfur. Um, we've got to cry out when uh, UN uh, and uh, AU uh, uh, people out there in Darfur are, are murdered. But we also have to cry out when they continue to murder people who are from Darfur. Uh, that has to be put on the news every night if we can do it. Uh, the best right now that's doing that uh, is BBC News. Uh, the third uh, thing that is needed is punishment. The people who are committing these crimes need to be told in no uncertain terms that they will be punished. And the referral by the UN Security Council to the International Criminal Court was a major step forward in that. Uh, I think in that effort. Because genocidists expect impunity. If you can stop the expectation of impunity, you have gone some distance towards keeping people from continuing their crimes.